44 The Everlasting Gospel, a balanced Bible study, dispensational study rightfully emphasizes the distinctions within scripture as a key component of Bible study. However, the student or teacher who becomes overly enamored by the differences tends to underemphasize the underlying truths which remain constant across dispensational lines. This may seem insignificant until one considers that emphasizing the differences while ignoring important parallels predisposes a person toward hyperdispensationalism. On the other hand, studying areas of consistency forms a balanced approach to Bible study. Every Bible student needs balance. The need for this balanced Bible study is true in every aspect but especially true as it pertains to salvation. Terminology and messages generally change from one dispensation to another, however, foundational truths show forth several common denominators. Recognizing these commonalities helps both teacher and student avoid the pitfalls caused by misrepresenting God, ordained Bible study methods in other words, hyper, dividing the Bible. Defining gospel one cannot overemphasize the importance of distinguishing church age applications from those messages preached to different people groups throughout history or yet in the future. In fact, this facet of Bible study helps us understand how to properly distinguish various applications with their dispensational implications. Those who attempt to deny any gospel variations in scripture might as well deny the veracity of scripture altogether. The variations exist with prevalent number and impacting magnitude. The Bible uses identifying terminology to distinguish each of the Gospels, or the various features of the same Gospel, from one another. To help the Bible student to differentiate the different Gospels or to understand the unique perspectives of the same Gospel, the Bible implements specific or descriptive terminology. For example, the Bible speaks of the Gospel of the Kingdom, Matthew 4. 23, the Gospel of the Grace of God, Acts 20, 24, the Gospel of God, Romans 1, 1, the Gospel of His God's Son, Romans 1, 9, the Gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16, the Gospel of Peace, Romans 10, 15, the Gospel of the Uncircumcision, Galatians 2, 7, the Gospel of the Circumcision, Galatians 2, 7, the Gospel of Your Salvation, Ephesians 1, 13, and Lastly the Everlasting Gospel, Revelation 14, 6 Paul even used some peculiar wording in his epistles by Referring to my Gospel on three separate occasions, Romans 2, 16, Romans 16, 25, 2 Timothy 2, 8 some of these designations point to a single message preached to the self-same people group. When these particular designations overlap, their descriptive variations distinguish a particular aspect of the same gospel message. However, the Bible student must account for the fact that some of the other designations have distinct meanings presented to different people groups. Their meanings and their purposes are further determined by the context found in the scripture. Therefore, it is a serious error to equate them as equal and synonymous. Gospel definition Consider the gospel message preached by the Apostle Paul as an example of how the Bible specifically defines a particular gospel. Paul defined his gospel as including Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Paul plainly delineated the details of this gospel in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as follows, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, that he was buried, 1 Corinthians 15, 4, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. No Bible believer would ever dispute the precision with which Paul made the proclamation of his gospel. Anyone claiming to preach the gospel today must emphasize the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Yet, Many Bible teachers treat the multiple Bible references to the Gospel as they would an algebraic equation where they simply plug in a constant. The plugged, in constant would be that Gospel in the Bible always equals Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Yet, considering the details of this particular Gospel preached by the Apostle Paul creates huge doctrinal problems for those who treat the Gospel message in this fashion. Those who choose this robotic method refuse to rightly divide the Bible. 
In doing so, they propagate a false teaching and create confusion amongst those searching for truth. In earlier chapters, we studied how Jesus' disciples were ignorant of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Their understanding was limited, yet we also understand that they placed their faith in a gospel the gospel of the kingdom. This gospel message could not have been referring to Christ's finished work on the cross because the Jews were looking forward to the appearing of the kingdom, not Christ's sacrifice. Here is one such example. Luke 19, 11 And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Hezekiah was typical of an Old Testament saint looking for the Messiah's return to the land of Israel. He asked for additional time for two reasons, one, so he could live out the residue of his years, and, two, he hoped to be reigning as king when the Lord returned to Israel. Isaiah 38, 10 I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave, I am deprived of the residue of my years. 11 I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living, I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Therefore, it is a major point of emphasis during the earthly ministry of Christ for the Jews to accept or believe on him as the Christ, Matthew 16, 16 to 17, John 1, 41, John 4, 25 to 29, John 8, 24, John 13, 19, God's Anointed, Psalm 2, 2, Acts 4, 26. Those who trusted in him as such were called his sheep, John 10, 14, 26 to 27, John 21, 16 to 17. Now, consider the problems associated with plugging in Paul's definition of the gospel into verses like Galatians 3, 8 and Hebrews 4, 1 to 2. Galatians 3, 8 and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. If we simply plug death, burial, and resurrection into this passage, we should be able to find Christ's death, burial, and resurrection being preached to Abraham. Yet, there exists no record of anyone preaching this message to Abraham. In fact, Abraham's gospel message was clearly identified in this verse as in thee shall all nations be blessed. Read the statements in context, and simply believe what the Bible says. The scripture preached the gospel to Abraham saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. If this same gospel message was preached by anyone today, they would be accursed for preaching a false gospel, Galatians 1, 8-9. Now, Consider another example with the same dilemma of plugging the death, burial, and resurrection into every mention of gospel. This time Hebrews references the gospel preached to the children of Israel. Hebrews 4, 1 Let us therefore fear, lest, a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. 2 For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The reference to them in Hebrews 4, 2 demands a look into the context of the passage. Verse 17 of the previous chapter in Hebrews shows the context found in chapter 4 those in the wilderness for 40 years. Every Bible student recognizes this as the nation of Israel. Hebrews 3, 17 But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. At no point when the Jews were in the wilderness do we read of them hearing the gospel of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Nor do we find anywhere that they rejected Christ's sacrificial death. They simply did not hear this message. In fact, we read in Hebrews that their message majored upon entering into a specified rest, Hebrews 3, 11, 18, Hebrews 4, 1, 3 to 5, 8 to 11. For example, Hebrews 4, 5, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Clearly, it is wrong to limit the gospel definitions to some preconceived parameter based upon some oft, repeated assumptions. 
From these few examples one can readily see the dangers of failing to identify any particular gospel's distinguishing traits and message content. Yet, many Bible teachers are oblivious to this truth and outright reject it because they have been duped into trusting an algebraic fix. It also becomes quite apparent to any astute Bible student that the word gospel has a broader meaning than the one commonly associated with it. Again, it is important to let the Bible speak. We discover the definition by allowing scripture to define itself and by comparing spiritual things with spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2, 13. Fortunately, God has given man the necessary internal Bible study tools. One of the most effective tools involves allowing New Testament quotations from Old Testament passages to define terminology. In the context of our discussion, there are three Old Testament passages, Isaiah 52, 7, Nahum 1, 15, Isaiah 61, 1, quoted in the New Testament that implement the word gospel. In each case, the quotation from the Old Testament into the New reveals the phrase good tidings as equivalent to gospel. Isaiah 52, 7 and Nahum 1, 15 are found in Romans 10, 15, and Isaiah 61, 1 in Luke 4, 18. For example, Isaiah 61, 1 The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. Luke 4, 18 The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. From these insightful examples, we know that the gospel in every dispensation refers to God's good tidings for those addressed or those to be addressed in the future. Furthermore, each dispensation has general and underlying truths that tie the whole of scripture together, especially as it pertains to man's personal salvation and his fellowship with God. One and only one gospel Paul wrote to the Galatian believers that his spirit was troubled because these believers were saved by the gospel of Christ but willingly gave ear to others who preached a false gospel. Paul used this opportunity to make it abundantly clear that there existed only one gospel during the church age. Galatians 1, 6 I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, 7 which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul referred to this gospel as the gospel of Christ or alternatively as the the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. Although others were preaching another gospel, Paul plainly stated that this other so, called gospel was actually no gospel at all because it was false. Paul condemned this false preaching with the harshest of terminology. Galatians 1, 8 But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 9 As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Those who teach the existence of other gospels outside of the period of the church age are not guilty of God's condemnation because the condemnation is quite specific. It says that if anyone, man or angel, preaches any other so, called gospel unto you, they are accursed. There is only one gospel today, and it always points back to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Yet, this truth does not negate the fact that the Bible refers to other gospels outside the present church age. The Bible is very specific concerning the condemnation directed toward those who preach any other gospel today. The foundation of man's salvation although the gospel message has varied throughout time, some things have remained constant, without these constants, no man, regardless of the dispensation, can spend eternity with God. These things include grace, faith, and blood. I. Grace although this may seem quite simplistic, grace points to the unmerited favor of God. In other words, Grace means that man does not deserve what he gets but receives benefits based solely upon God's goodness, i.e. God's grace. There does seem to be some particular distinction in emphasis of grace between the Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament consistently refers to grace being found, whereas, the New Testament generally refers to grace being given. The Old Testament presents grace as being found by those who sought for it. 
A few examples among the many include Noah, Moses, and Gideon. Noah, Genesis 6, 8 But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Some point to Genesis 7, 1 that says that the Lord supposedly saved Noah by works because he saw righteousness. Yet, Noah is not the exception to the rule that righteousness comes by faith and faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. The book of Hebrews says that Noah heard the warning that God spoke to him hearing God's warning is the very definition of hearing the word of God. Plainly, faith came to Abraham from hearing the word of God. The book of Hebrews says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith, Hebrews 11, 7. Why did Noah prepare the ark? It was by faith after he heard the word of God, which caused him to fear what he heard and trust in the one who spoke to him. Noah feared God's warning and trusted God, which is evidenced by the fact that he built the ark. His example made him the heir of righteousness, which is by faith and not by works. Moses, Exodus 33, 13 Now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight. Gideon, Judges 6, 16 And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. 17 And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then shew me a sign that thou talkest with me. These are not the only examples since the Old Testament contains 20, 8 separate references to grace being found. Contrarywise, the New Testament contains only one reference to grace being found referring to those who come boldly before the throne of grace to find that particular grace in time of need, Hebrews 4, 16. Unlike the Old Testament, the New Testament places the emphasis upon grace being given. There are 14 New Testament references to grace being given while only two exist in the Old Testament, Psalm 84, 11, Proverbs 3, 34, with the verse in Proverbs quoted in 1 Peter. Some examples of New Testament grace given are found in these passages, Romans 12, 3, 6, Romans 15, 15, 1 Corinthians 1, 4, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, Galatians 2, 9, Ephesians 3, 2, 7 to 8, Ephesians 4, 7, 2 Timothy 1, 9, James 4, 6, and 1 Peter 5, 5. 2. Faith Some Bible teachers claim that when God blesses man with his presence, like in the garden with Adam or in the future millennium, there will be no need for faith because people will see God. However, this theory is flawed on several fronts. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, present on earth, and he repeatedly commented concerning the need for faith. Therefore, God's presence does not negate the necessity of faith. The Bible directly contradicts this teaching by proclaiming that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6 But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. No doubt, Adam's faith failed when he chose to disobey God by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Likewise, the faith of those in the millennium will fail when they choose to revolt against the rule of King Jesus, Revelation 20, 6. The point is that faith is always necessary to please God without exception in every age. Regardless of where one opens the scripture, the individual was responsible for exercising faith in what God told him to do, which was always witnessed by the fact that the individual did what God told him to do. Although this is true concerning the absolute necessity of faith in every age, the object of man's faith has necessarily changed in relation to God's message for each generation. In fact, in spite of the Old Testament emphasis on strict obedience to the law, for the last 1,500 years of the 4,000-year time period, the New Testament indicates that the greater truth was that man's obedience was a result of the necessary virtue of faith, see Hebrews chapter 11. Why did Abel make the right offering, why was Enoch translated, why did Noah prepare an ark, and why did Abraham obey?
The answer is plainly given in each case it was because of faith. Man can see the works, but God sees the faith driving the obedience. By faith Abel offered, Hebrews 11, 4. By faith Enoch was translated, Hebrews 11, 5. By faith Noah, prepared an ark, Hebrews 11, 7. By faith Abraham, obeyed, Hebrews 11, 8. Along with many additional examples. Each of these men, along with every other example, did the works because of their underlying faith. This confirms and attests to the truth taught concerning Abraham when the Bible says, he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. This same truth is so crucial that it is repeated throughout the New Testament. Romans 4, 3 For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Galatians 3, 6 Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. James 2, 23 And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. What motivated Abraham to obey God? Faith. This same virtue motivated every other Old and New Testament believer. Yet, it must be understood that one cannot see a person's faith except through his works. Therefore, James pointed to the fact that faith and works are never mutually exclusive, one simply has no faith if his works testify otherwise. Godly faith always produces the right works. James 2, 18 Yet, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works, shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. 3. Blood Much confusion exists as to the efficacy of the Old Testament sacrifices. Although some preachers have attributed salvific power to the blood of animals in the Old Testament sacrifices, the Bible clearly refutes this teaching when it refers to the impossibility that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins, Hebrews 10, 4. The law and its sacrifices were a mere shadow of better things to come, Hebrews 10, 1. This is why the blood of Christ not only had to be shed for the sins of those living after the cross under the New Testament, but also for the redemption of the transgressions for those under the First Testament, the Old Testament. Hebrews 9, 15 And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The timing of the shedding and application of the blood of Christ changed historically, all in relation to the cross of Christ. For instance, those after the cross have deliverance the moment they trust Christ, Ephesians 1, 13. However, the souls of Old Testament saints could not be delivered from paradise, in the heart of the earth, until after Christ's sacrificial death on the cross as well as his ascension into heaven where he placed his blood upon the mercy seat, Matthew 27, 52-53, Ephesians 4, 8. This in no way suggests that those living prior to the cross looked forward to the cross for salvation in the same manner that those after the cross look back to the cross. Those before the cross definitely saw shadows and types of Christ's sacrifice, but they lacked our understanding of the blood of Christ or the sacrifice that he would make. Nor do we have any indication that they were required to trust in the blood of Christ to know God. Yet, not one soul will spend eternity in heaven apart from the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Summing up the whole of salvation throughout every age, salvation is made possible only by the grace of God granted based upon a man's personal faith in God's particular revelation, and facilitated only through the perfect, spotless blood of Christ. Any other means whereby a man could be saved frustrates the grace of God and Christ's sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary. Galatians 2, 21 I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Most would agree with this concerning the gospel preached today but Paul identified Israel's failure in seeking the law of righteousness through the works of the law rather than by faith. Clearly stated, the Israelite failed if he sought righteousness through works. Romans 9, 
31 But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. 32 Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Foundational requirement for the light of salvation The million, dollar question, how does any man receive the necessary light to know God throughout the various dispensations? This single question leads into several other corresponding questions. Does God or did God look specifically for some characteristic when dispensing light and truth? Is there a shared thread that more closely unites every dispensation? The answers to these questions are expressed in the opening lines of the message preached by the angel who will fly in the midst of heaven during Daniel's 70th week. We are told that this angel preaches the everlasting gospel, and the first two words of this gospel boldly admonish the hearers to fear God. Revelation 14, 6 And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, seven saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Clearly indicated by its name, the angel will be preaching the everlasting gospel, which sets forth a message that has spanned throughout all time, including the 2,500 years prior to the giving of the law. The fact that this gospel is called everlasting distinguishes it in duration from every other gospel preached. For instance, the gospel preached by Paul had a definitive beginning and will have a precise ending, beginning, Philippians 4, 15 Now ye Philippians know also, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but yet only. Ending, Romans 11, 25 For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. This gospel message during the church age has seven various designations, 1, the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24, 2, the gospel of God, Romans 1, 1, 3, the gospel of his Son, Romans 1, 9, 4, the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16, 5, my gospel, Romans 2, 16, 6, the gospel of peace, Ephesians 6, 15, and, 7, our gospel the glorious gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. This gospel serves as the only gospel offering salvation during the church age but will transition at the rapture when the gospel of the kingdom gets reinstituted. Matthew 24, 14. The book of Proverbs confirms the antiquity of the message preached by the angel in Revelation. Heeding this everlasting gospel in our present age gets God's attention in a gospel witness. Cornelius is a prime example of this fact. Acts 10, 2. We see from Proverbs that this same message has been proclaimed as far back as the creation, Proverbs 8, 12-31. Read it carefully and prayerfully as it personifies wisdom and relates it to the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 8, 12 I wisdom dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. 13 The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth, do I hate. Later in the same proverb, Solomon continues with the personification of wisdom as it relates to the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 8, 23 I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. 24 When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no fountains abounding with water. 25 Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. 26 While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. 27 When he prepared the heavens, I was there, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. 28 When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep. 29 When he gave to the sea his decree, that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. 30 Then I was by him, 
as one. Brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, wisdom is the fear of the Lord, Job 28, 28, and was set up from everlasting, verse 23 above, because God intended for it to be the focal point of the everlasting gospel. The fear of the Lord brings about repentance. The problem with the lost is that there is no fear of the Lord, Romans 3, 18. Fortunately, Job gave some further insight by defining wisdom. He pronounced that wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Job 28, 28 And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. These truths are reiterated in the book of Psalms. The Psalms repeatedly state that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalm 111, 10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. Proverbs 9, 10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now, looking back at the context of Proverbs 8, we see that the fear of the Lord, wisdom, was set up from everlasting. Everlasting, Proverbs 8, 23 and specifically points out that that meant while as yet he had not made the earth, Proverbs 8, 26. This would make wisdom, or the fear of the Lord, precede much of what we read in the early chapters of Genesis, which references the making of the earth. Regardless of the exact timing, we know that this period refers to a time extending the entirety of man's present 6,000 years of existence. Furthermore, it continues as the angel in Revelation testifies that it will be the gospel preached to those on earth during Daniel's 70th week. Solomon offered additional details. At the conclusion of his grand experiment to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven, Ecclesiastes 1, 13, he stated, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God, and keep his commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Thus, this same fear of God was declared by Solomon to be one half of the whole duty of man, the other being obedience toward God. It is important to note that a man's fear of God and his faith in God are inseparable companions. Fear produces faith and faith produces fear. For example, when the nation of Israel saw the Lord's work upon the Egyptians, they feared the Lord, and believed the Lord, Exodus 14, 31. In this case, as well as many other instances, their eyes directly affected their hearts, Lamentations 3, 51, introducing fear and thus producing faith. Truth only applies to the fear of the Lord and not the ungodly fear produced by the lack of faith in God. The Bible contrasts the two fears when it points out that the fear of man brings a snare. Proverbs 29, 25 The fear of man bringeth a snare but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. If that were not enough, the scripture indicates a far greater truth concerning the fear of the Lord. For ages, God's people have speculated and sometimes debated why one man receives more light concerning the truth than that received by others. We might at times claim ignorance, trusting rather that the judge of all the earth shall do right, Genesis 18, 25, but the question remains. Why do some men receive the light that others simply do not receive? The answer may surprise you. Fear producing faith Another important piece of the puzzle that helps to unlock this conundrum is a careful reading of Cornelius' testimony in the book of Acts. The Bible says that Cornelius was a devout man, and one that feared God, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. Acts 10, 2, yet, from the testimony of Scripture, he was not yet a saved man. In fact, when Peter arrived at Cornelius' house, Cornelius in this state of ignorance fell down at his feet, and worshipped him, Acts 10, 25. Cornelius' fear of God continued to increase his exposure to the truth until he received sufficient light to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Peter expressed his understanding on the matter as he talked with Cornelius. Cornelius' fear did not save him but certainly aided in producing the necessary light and faith in that light. Acts 10, 35 But in every nation he that feareth him, 
and worketh righteousness, is accepted with him. Indisputably, it was faith that saved Cornelius, but the fear of God opened the door of opportunity for him to be saved. Without that fear, people simply find no need for trusting in the Lord the necessary prerequisite for salvation. No trust equals no salvation. Ephesians 1, 13 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, Matthew prophesied that the Gentiles would trust in the name of Jesus, Matthew 12, 21, and Paul testified that he placed his trust in the living God, 1 Timothy 4, 10. Yet, Paul explicitly addressed his plea concerning salvation to the whosoever that fear God. Maybe Paul took for granted that the men of Israel in the synagogue were there because they feared God, but the others present were a mixed multitude, some feared, some did not. Acts 13, 16 Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. After a lengthy history lesson recorded in Acts chapter 13, one that ended with the focus squarely upon Jesus and the word of salvation, Paul concluded his remarks to whosoever with a qualifier whosoever feareth God. Acts 13, 26 Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. There can be no disputing the fact that the fear of the Lord preceded men's faith and spiritual awakening. Paul concluded his remarks to this group with the death, burial, and resurrection, Acts 13, 28-30. He called this the glad tidings, gospel, Acts 13, 32, of the promise made to the fathers. His speech ended with an appeal to believe and be justified, Acts 13, 38 to 39, something the law of Moses could not do. Since the completion of the New Testament canon, the same truth is evident for those who have believed. Rahab serves as another example of someone who trusted in the Lord. Interestingly, the offer of deliverance was not limited to Rahab, but to whosoever. This wording was by divine design. Joshua 2, 19 and it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless, and whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. The appeal for deliverance was to whosoever, and those who trusted the revelation given stayed in the house. Their inward belief was reflected by their outward works. However, it is equally important to see that Rahab admitted that she feared, and therefore believed, and all of that before she hid the spies. Joshua 2, 11 And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man, because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above, and in earth beneath. History records many heathen villages receiving the gospel witness through a missionary whom the Lord had sent to them. The origins of the entire missionary endeavor can generally be traced to somebody in that location that feared the incomplete. Knowledge he or she possessed of the creator of the universe, see Psalm 19, 1-6. That fear ultimately brought the light and the opportunity to exercise faith in the completed revelation of the cross of Christ. Where the fear of God exists in a man, he can be assured of two things he will continue to receive light until he has enough light to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. He will have the full and undivided attention of the God of the universe. Isaiah 66, 2 For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. It is no coincidence that the everlasting gospel begins with fear God, Revelation 14, 6-7 Nor is it insignificant that Solomon declared the fear of God, along with keeping the commandments, to be the conclusion of the whole matter and the whole duty of man, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Take note that unbelievers cannot fulfill the whole duty of man because they cannot keep the commandments of God in a state of unbelief. As scripture attests, the fear of the Lord has been arresting the attention of the Lord, 
Isaiah 66, 2, and acquiring additional light for men, Acts 10, 2, for thousands of years and throughout every dispensation. Psalm 25, 12 What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Psalm 25, 14 The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will shew them his covenant. Proverbs 2, 5 Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Acts 10, 34 Then Peter opened his mouth, and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, 35 But in every nation he that feareth him, and worketh righteousness, is accepted with him. Fear not producing faith the single common denominator amongst the lost atheist, evolutionist, and agnostic is that they have no fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the key. All those who reject the Lord do so because they do not fear him with the necessary godly and reverential fear. However, if the fear does not turn into faith, that person will likewise reject the truth and reject the Savior. For instance, Felix, the governor, feared what he heard but rejected the underlying truth nonetheless. Acts 24, 25 And as he Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled, and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. We have no indication that Felix's fear ever lead to any saving faith. Fear that fails to produce faith leaves the individual without Christ and without hope. Fear producing faith unsurprisingly, we do have two specific instances where men in the Bible feared prior to salvation. Acts chapter 9 records God's interactions with Saul prior to his conversion. Acts 9, 6 And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Acts chapter 16 records the Philippian jailer who asked what he must do to be saved. He was told that he must simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. His fear obviously led to saving faith. Acts 16, 29 Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, 30 and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 31 And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Some may claim that fear is a work, but those same people would then find it difficult to defend that faith is somehow not a work. The truth is that neither fear nor faith are works. They are the instruments used of God to bring people to himself. Any person who rejects the words of the everlasting gospel rejects the God of the everlasting gospel. Why did the so? called old, fashioned preacher preach messages on hell, fire, and damnation to thee. Lost? Was it not to produce the fear of God that only faith in Christ Jesus can resolve? After all, fear produces faith, and Paul wrote that believers are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 26 For yet are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. There are many examples throughout scripture where the fear of the Lord produces the God, intended results, Exodus 14, 31. Unfortunately, there are also many examples where man ignores the light and the fear of the Lord. When this takes place, the fear of the Lord does not bring about God's desired results, 2 Kings 17, 32-33. In John Newton's famous song Amazing Grace, he began his second stanza with twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved.